we're going to spend the next 30, 45 minutes talking about why sales in the main are vanity. It's profit that is sanity, and profit is often the secret that gets forgotten to make the sale work. It's vital to sell to the right people. It's vital that we work on improving our conversion ratios. It's vital that we build a more powerful proposition. And all those things can help us avoid the price pressure, which is the, the kind of real crunch point that so many of us as salespeople and business owners have to face up to. So let's talk about the secret of selling more at a higher margin. Now, do alter your chat settings so that uh, we can all hear, hear. We can all read the, the comments that you put in, in the box. I, I am going to ask you to put some comments in the box so they can interact with everybody. Thank you for that. So my promise to you is I am going to reveal the answer to this really crucial question. What is the single most important question that any salesperson could ask? I will give you that answer. We'll be talking through some real practical life examples, and we will talk about how to apply some of the secrets within the profit secret. And we will ensure you get at least two ideas you can implement tomorrow so you can move this whole thing forward. Uh, there is an offer for you, those who wish to connect up with me afterwards. The first person that sends me an email after this session is going to get a very special prize. Please remember to take notes. Think and write stuff down. You can put it in electronic format if, if you want. You can stick it into your iPad or stick it onto your laptop, but please record stuff. You, know, you want at least one lesson out of every minute that we talk this through. You'll end up with 30. If you record it and act on those ideas, you'll get high value from this time. If you just listen, you might act on some of it. No action. Well, you've had a good mid-afternoon break. First question, my business partner and running buddy, my um, soulmate, without wanting to get into kind of um, male-female debates, uh, but my best friend in my life, sadly no longer with us, is a guy called Nick Baldock. He co-authored two of the books with me and was probably the best salesman I've ever worked with and probably the best sales trainer I've ever worked with. Um, some of you may have known Nick, so put it in the chat. If you knew Nick, I just would love to know if there's anybody in the room today who'd met Nick. Shame that you didn't actually get to meet him then. Um, it does mean I can steal some of his jokes, though, so that's good news. One of Nick's phrases was, I'm watching you, <laughs> you, <laughs> I'm watching you. So I will be keeping my eye on you. This session is about thinking about being different, different enough to succeed. We do not have to be better. We merely have to be different enough. We do not have to be unique. I do not believe in USPs, unique selling propositions and unique selling points. The U means uncommon. We need to be uncommon, not unique. We can be different enough and make huge progress. Even if we are different, we have to face up to the fact that most salespeople and most businesses will come under price pressure. There's nothing new with that. Most new businesses and most new products fail, either because there's not a product market fit or there's not a price fit or there's not enough profit. Why, why do we set ourselves up to fail or at least why do we set ourselves up to struggle? And that's why I believe that profit is the missing secret that makes sales and businesses far more authentic. We need to put that front and center. So this is about how we can win more than we lose. We have to find a way, particularly as we come out of a pandemic, more businesses will fail for lack of cash and profit coming out of a crisis than those that go in it. The pandemic itself does not cause most of the problems. It merely highlights failures within the systems and the processes and often the pricing strategies, the sales strategies that were already there. So we're going to talk about defending our price. Of course, all of this is in the book and everybody's entitled to a code which will make the ebook free. If you want a hard copy 
All you got to do is email me afterwards and I will send you a physical hard copy for free. Let's make it clear. It is absolutely pointless taking a defensive point of view when you know you're going to be attacked. It is highly likely that we're going to come under price pressure at some point in the majority of our sales conversations. So we might as well be proactive instead. Now, to be proactive, we have to set the business up in the first place in the right kind of way or set the product itself or the service itself up in the right kind of way in order to be profitable. And if we're already set up, then we might need to make some adjustments. Let me bring a case study to bear. This set of wonderful headphones was launched by Apple a few years back. And when they launched it, uh, the brand new pair was worth about 500 pounds. Now, I've no idea exactly what their price, uh, their gross profit margin was, but let's say they made 250 pounds gross profit from each pair of headphones. Now, let's say that Apple set out a strategy that would sell them a million pound, a million items, a million units of these headphones across the world. If they managed to sell a million units at a gross profit per unit of 250 pounds, put it in the chat, how much profit would Apple have made? Two hundred and fifty million. Yay! Two hundred and fifty million smackers. Now, let's last ask another question. If they only sold, if the product bombed and they only sold a hundred thousand, can you imagine Apple selling only one hundred thousand of anything? And the profit per item was two hundred and fifty pounds, a gross profit per item. How much money would they have made gross profit? on 100,000, 25 million, 25 million. Have you got that? That is crazy. Now compare that to this product, which is a leading product on the market now. Last time I checked, about six months ago, they were selling for 25 pound. Let's say the gross profit on this set of headphones is 12 pounds. If they sell a million of these, little cherubs how much profit do they make 12 million now i'm sorry those maths look weird to me why would we set ourselves up to have to do such a huge number at such a low profit i don't understand now of course different people buy different products for different reasons so if you made this house and put it on the market you would be attracting a completely different customer with a completely different price point than you would if you built this house and put it on the market. Or if you built this house and put it on the market. The person you're trying to attract, they're going to be different. We've got to offer them something that really pulls and resonates with them. The cost of customer acquisition is something we have to think about the target market we're going after and the ideal customer profile is absolutely something we have to nail because if we if we get that wrong, we're trying to sell this kind of stuff to this kind of consumer. That little girl is not in that market. She's in that market. We forget that sometimes in our excitement to get what we believe is just an amazing product out into the market. Having acquired a customer, We've got to make a profit from them. And there is a scary statistic that we all have a fair number of unprofitable customers in our sales ledger already. We've attracted the wrong kind of person and we're probably trying to hang on to them. Some research would suggest that 30% of your customers are costing you 50% of your profit. Please do the research before you cut them loose but it is scary. The low hanging fruit in our sales ledger could actually be costing you a lot of money. Now, why would we be silly enough not to really be specific about attracting the right kind of prospect? 
It really, really matters. Why would you go after people that you don't enjoy working with? It doesn't make sense. Now, this is a day flying moth. And this day flying moth loves particular plants. I only learned that because about 12 years ago, a friend of mine who's really into day flying moths of all sorts of kinds, this is called a hummingbird moth. He was asked by David Attenborough's team to get six hummingbird moths for a TV program. And we happened to be in France at the time. Being a geek, he always carried his kit with him. So out we went one day to find ourselves some hummingbird moths, which he knew would be out in the bright French sunshine of the Loire Valley. And we walked around for hours and we found one, which was not enough for David Attenborough. He wanted six. Towards the end of the day, we came across one particular plant, a red valerian plant, around which there were three of these hummingbird moths. So I said to my dear friend, Paul, wow, why have we got so many moths around this here bush? And he said, oh, that's one of their favorite foods. They loved a red valerian. I said, you numpty, we've been walking all over the fields of France looking for the moths. We should have been looking for the bush. If we'd have found the bush, we'd have found the hummingbird moths. That's all we did for the rest of the day was look for the red valerian. In fairness, we could also look for the honeysuckle or the jasmine or the buddleia because they also love them too. So instead of going hunting for the moths, we went looking where the moths eat and we found more than we needed. Having an ideal customer profile, knowing exactly what you're looking for, and why you're looking for that can make a huge difference to the way you put up your sales and marketing strategy. You know, imagine selling um, an offer through an advertising campaign and having the majority of people who read that advertising campaign as non-prospects. Yet we do it all the time. We're not targeted enough. We have to think about whether we're trying to go after the total available market with our money or whether we can laser focus, laser focus the spend of our marketing and the effort of our sales and marketing team to the real highly likely audience, the ones that are really going to make a difference. One of my clients um, sells into uh, people that live in apartments, high rise apartments. We could spend a fortune advertising to right across the country but where are the majority of high-rise departments they're in london if you think even narrow it down to a much smaller postcode area then we can spend the same amount of marketing budget the same amount of sales effort to a much more targeted area and instead of spending twenty thousand pounds to go after a couple of million people we spend the same twenty thousand pounds and go after 100,000 people. So knowing where your butterflies eat, knowing where your fish consume, knowing where your prospects go, and where you can find them in big clusters can make a huge difference. But we can't work that out unless you've got a really clear customer profile or ideal prospect profile, if you prefer. Do remember, write some ideas down. Please write something down in response to what we're saying that you can do something within a couple of days. If you've got some ideas already, stick it in the chat. Keep that notepad active. Now, of course, ideas that we're trying to encourage you to write down and be stimulated by, they're important in our business as well. We need to use our ideas about our business, our products, our services, our customers in order to forge the differentiators that will help us make a huge difference across our business. And you can do that in the entire operation, not just in the products. So for instance, Southwest Airlines is often used as a case study here. The, the, the low cost airline across America these days. And considering they're a low cost airline, they're one of the few airlines pre-pandemic that was actually profitable. They have made huge differentiations. How? Because you don't buy an airplane ticket. 
you don't buy a ticket. It's not just a ticket, it's a love ticket. And where do you get your love tickets to go on Southwest Airlines? You get them from a love machine. And you can have a drink on board if you want, but it's not just any drink, it's a love potion. So they have forged differentiators in their entire business. And they haven't spent a fortune to create funky love potions. You're gonna drink, get a drink of water. You're gonna get a drink of orange. You're gonna get a drink of peach. It's not rocket science. Southwest Airlines have made it a policy to encourage their staff to have fun at work. And those people having fun at work have entertained everybody that flies with them. Occasionally they get into trouble because they punched a few people on the nose. We hear about it because it's completely unusual. It's not common. Don't get that service on Ryanair either. <laughs> Please remember, all these ideas are in the profit secret. Remember to get your free ebook. And if you want a hard copy, send me an email. These three boxes give us a significant insight into the components of incredibly strong value propositions. We have to have something that resonates with the target market. We have to have something that differentiates ourselves from other people in the same marketplace. And we have to be able to substantiate it. And if we can achieve those three key components, then believe me, we have a chance to sell at a much higher margin than you might think possible. It is crucial that we find the point of pain in our prospect's journey through their decision-making process from prospect to customer. The decision to buy is made in the pain of the present, not in the features and the benefits of our wonderful product or service that we all get so excited about. Salespeople, business owners want to gush nonstop about the features and the benefits of working with them. Actually, face bothered not. The decision to buy is made in the pain of the present. Story goes, there was an old dog sitting on a wooden porch. If you've listened to Zig Ziglar many years ago, you'd have heard him tell this story. The dog howls every now and again. The neighbor asks the owner of the dog, why is your dog howling? It says, because under where he's sitting, there is a nail. And every time he takes a deep breath, it catches him and it hurts and he howls. Neighbor says, why doesn't the dog move? Owner says, I guess it just doesn't hurt enough. So we have to find the pain of the prospect and make sure it hurts enough. Your biggest competitor is probably your prospects doing nothing. Doing nothing occurs something like 60% of the time. You may think you're fighting a competition. You're actually fighting the cost of doing nothing. And so identifying the pain is only part of what we have to do to ensure we can sell more at a higher margin. Part of it is for us as people to become a consultant. You know, in the medical consulting profession, giving a prescription of a solution would be called malpractice if it was given before a thorough diagnosis. Prescription before diagnosis is called malpractice. Why would we as a professional make a recommendation on, a, on the features and the benefits of the products and services we sell that our businesses make if we haven't actually proven a pain hypothesis? If they haven't actually verbally signed off on, yes, that's my problem and I need it fixed now. And no, I can't go on with this state. Something's got to change. We always have to be a consultant. You know, sometimes we've got to be a detective as well because the client's not the best expert on this. You know, one of my clients sells um, secondhand sports cars, probably the, one of the biggest secondhand sports car dealers in the country. They've had a phenomenal time over this COVID period, some of the biggest sales they've ever had. And they have to be very clever in the way that they work with people and search out not just the cars that they want, but the reasons behind that purchase, because that is a discretionary purchase. And even behind that, if you're a good enough detective, there is always a pain. 
Now, it might be an ego pain because I want to look better than my neighbor. There are a variety of pains, but we have to be both a consultant and a detective. Now, to be a consultant or a detective, we've got to ask a bunch of questions. And I'm sure you're used to Rudyard Kipling's Six Good Serving Men, which will help you create a series of open questions and get the prospect talking, of course. But which of those questions, the what questions, the who questions, the where questions, the when questions, the how questions, the why questions, which of those question types would you avoid? Put it in the chat. Which would you avoid? Why? Very good. Why is how? <laughs> We've got a few whys. I wouldn't avoid any. OK, well, here's the thought process. What type of answer do you get when you ask a why question? What type of answer do you get? You get a personal opinion. You do get an open answer. You might get a defensive answer because it's often seen as a critical question. Why did you do that? You didn't mean it to be critical, but it's easy for it to come across that way. Usually with a why type question, you get an opinion. And as a consultant and as a detective, you're looking for evidence. The best two questions are what questions and how questions. The who, the, who, the when, and the where really only get you data. So the two best open questions are what and how. So please remember, write it down. Avoid the why questions. Convert them to what or how type questions. Use the who, the where, and the when to collect a bit of data. It really matters because you're trying to establish there is a gap between what people want and what people have, and we need them to be able to verbalize it. It's really rude if you tell people what their problem is. People don't like that. But if we can ask them and get them to verbalize what they think their pain point is, and we ask them a bit more about it, and we ask them to tell us a bit more about it, then the scale of that pain begins to change in their minds. And they are not going to complain about us. We have authentically made them think. Increasing that gap past pacing it or forward pacing it is a huge opportunity because we've got to get people to the point where they have verbalized not only that it hurts and it hurts this much it hurts so much i can't carry on with it the way it is and therefore i have to find a way to make a change our questions are really important the questions shape a room your questions control the conversation. They control another person's mind. The question you ask is what the other person responds to. And the size of that room really matters. The shape of that room really matters. If we don't shape the room and the door frame well enough, our door that we're going to try and close, you know the phrase, we want to close a sale, always be closing. You try closing a door if there's no door frame, if there's no wall. It goes a bit flappy. People procrastinate. People put things off. So the shape of the conversation is created by the questions. The framework of the solution can be created by the questions. The framework of the pain and the fact that they cannot put up with it any longer is all created by the questions. If we tell them, we're into trouble. Remember, write some things down. So we've talked about resonating with the pain points. We have to be different. Please remember, we have to be different. If we're not different, then the only difference is what? There's nothing different about our product or our service. What's the only difference? Price. Bingo. Price. Now, of course, there is another difference, and that's you. Bingo, Matthew, you're quite right. It's either the people involved or the price. So we have to make some things different. It's really important. Ask you a question. Would you prefer brown eggs or white eggs? Which do you prefer? Put it on the chat. Brown eggs or white eggs? Which do you prefer?
Brown. Don't care. Which do you prefer? Brown or white? White and yellow. I like the white and the yellow and the egg. Brown, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. They're chicken eggs. It don't make any sense. Why would you have a brown one? Why do supermarkets go to the trouble of separating brown eggs from white eggs? They don't taste any different, but they're different enough. That's what matters. And remember, we really should be eating duck eggs, not chicken eggs. Duck eggs are more nutritious. They contain much better cholesterol. They've got better protein. It's a higher concentration. Duck eggs are far better for us than chicken eggs. But we don't eat chick. We don't eat duck eggs because ducks don't advertise. When a duck lays an egg, it just goes quick. When a chicken lays an egg, it goes. Bark, 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 bark. We know about it. Remember to advertise. Just be different enough. If there's no difference, it's either the people or the price. So look up a model called Scamper. If you've got products and services and you're not conscious of the real difference that you've got strong differentiators look up a brainstorming model called scamper and take every aspect of your business and make it a little bit different you know you're looking for something that is elegant that fits a market that is profitable and has got longevity something elegant that works like the rubik's cube i mean who knew that that would last forever be careful when you design something because sometimes it could look a bit wrong and i struggle to look at that image because it it just does not look right and unfortunately lots of the products and services we put out to a market they, they don't fit the market we've we've done the design plenty of examples of big companies getting it wrong and a product bombing so please get lots of feedback come up with lots of ideas and test them test them test them live r d fire small bullets see if it hits the target fire another bullet see if it hits the target fire another bullet see if it hits the target when you're absolutely certain you've adjusted it and adjusted it and you keep consistently hitting wins then fire a cannonball but don't go big and large until you've rigorously tested it with the market if necessary, be prepared to be the difference yourself. I'd far rather you would be the difference. You would be the bigger egg, the brown egg or the white egg. There'll be enough of a difference if you're bold enough in how you as a human being are unique. There's only one of you. So we can leverage that. It's If you are the first person, for instance, to be trusted in a prospective conversation if there's no incumbent supplier and you're the first one to develop a trusted relationship you're usually the first one to be able to establish the value and you end up with the business relationships are very important please remember write some things down you want at least two ideas that you can do something with if you've got some ideas please say yes in the chat we have to learn to resonate we have to learn to differentiate we also have to be prepared to prove it okay we're a consultant we're a detective thank you for the yeses we have to prove the hypothesis of the pain we have to present that hypothesis of the pain to the prospect and ask them a bunch of questions so that they agree they admit they say yes that's right. That hypothesis of pain is correct. And if there's more than one person in the committee who's going to be making the decision, we have to nobble that committee. We have to nobble the influencers with evidence. And we do it best by getting them involved in the search for that evidence rather than us being the ones that tell them. Now, of course, if we can also find evidence that the return on their investment, their payback, which can be emotional as well as financial, will overweigh any of the costs that they put in, in the first place. If we can make it a no brainer, then we win on both sides of the equation. We've got them to verbalize the pain hypothesis. They've helped us find that evidence. They can't refute it. They helped to find it. And now they help us find the evidence for the return 
on the investment for the payback emotionally or financially. That's a compelling argument that very few people could step outside of. Remember, keep writing things down. So we resonate, we differentiate, and we substantiate. Now, if we've done all three and we do them well, if we've really thought about our target market, really got an ideal customer profile written, we've really fine-tuned who we go after in terms of our sales approach and our advertising approach and our marketing, we've really nailed down this whole philosophy of presenting a pain hypothesis because as a consultant and as a detective, we've found the evidence for that pain and got it from that client. And we've put this great proposition together, which they've helped us substantiate the return on investment. Would you agree we're probably going to improve our conversion ratio? Yes or no? Yes. Surely it's got to be yes. And if we want to work out why we sometimes have someone decline one of our proposals, well, my bet is there was either weak resonance, there was a situation where we're easy to substitute because we weren't different enough, um, or we couldn't prove either the pain hypothesis or the return on investment, or we tried to prove it without involving the client. Now, of course, in many situations, this is the unfortunate vicious circle that people get into. Now, so many of our clients, uh, when Nick and I were working together way back when and running uh, the sales training programs we were doing before we wrote The Profit Secret, we'd still get people after the training program ring ring us up and go, "Um, Bob, Nick, um, we've sent a customer a quote and uh, he's come back and asked for a price discount. What do we do now? Uh, And Nick or I would go, why did you send them the quote? You just started a conversation off on price. Why why would you start there? We didn't tell you to start there. You know, quotes are not great. Pricing strategies are not great. I get frustrated when I see websites which say, ask me for a quote. It's like, no, don't start the conversation off on price. We're going to end up finishing on price. You win on price, you lose on price. We make no profit. How would it be if it all started with, relationships and value has a much better place to start. Well, of course, we know the prospect is going through a decision-making process. There is a buying process. We have to align our buying process, their, sorry, their buying process with our sales process. We've got to make sure that we dance the dance of the prospect. So if they are doing a waltz, we're not doing a tango. Otherwise, we're going to tread on each other's toes. But a buying process is the one that rules. They have to go through that process. And it includes recognizing the pain. Hello, need recognition, is that? If they have a process, as do we, then surely it's just one step at a time. If we can get them to go through their buying process one step at a time and act as a buyer's coach, Even if we decide we want to push them through a sales process, really, we don't want to close the sale. We want to close the next step. If we can make each step really important and really valuable and really obvious, if we just keep making the next step, we're going to end up with the sale. So here comes the single most important question a salesperson can ask think about it it's a rhetorical question i'm not asking you to put anything in the chat but what is the single most important question for any salesperson to ask i would propose is this i'm going to invite my prospect to make a next step either in my sales process or their buying process If that is significant, it adds significant value, whether they end up being a customer or not, then surely it's going to be a no-brainer. How do I make the next step so obviously sensible that adds such significant value regardless of whether they become a customer in the end? Surely if we can come up with that, which I know requires a bit of thinking, 
we're going to make shed loads of progress because who's going to resist a no-brainer? Of course, it's got to include the hook, which is a uh, the pain point. Yes, it's going to have to include the benefit, the return on investment. Yes, you can put it together psychologically so that you associate the pain with the gain and you nail it all down. We can use a psychological approach. Yes, you can show the features and tell the benefits and ask how they would use them, how that would answer their pain points, how that would deliver their value. Yes, of course, you can do all of that. You can remember that you've got to include these six elements in every single proposition. The must-haves, the nice-to-have, the unique, not unique, the uncommon, nearly made that mistake, the uncommon edge that you're going to give them. You've got to answer their buying motives and their buying criteria. And do remember, people can spend money on something else. We had a debate in my house about whether we were going to spend um, six grand on an awning or six grand on a greenhouse. The people who were selling us the awning tried to compete and were offering us discounts. Fantastic for me, great negotiation skills, but really they weren't competing with another awning supplier. They were competing with the greenhouse. In the end, we got both. We have to think about what is the balance of importance versus the, our ability to prove that we match that importance from the prospect's point of view. So I know we've got to do all that. If we actually thought that hard about each next step and made it a no-brainer, then would someone not come with us on the journey? Surely they would. So we have to resonate, we have to differentiate, and we have to substantiate. We have to make the next step in the sales process a no-brainer. And if we do that, we will make a shed load of progress. Please remember, write some things down. Take some learning. Use the provocation and come up with something that you can do in the next two days. OK, who's got some ideas? Put a yes in the chat if you've got some ideas you can do something with. It's really important. Of course, everything we try might still come up with a zero. We might still find we end up in trouble and somebody challenges us on the price. So what happens? What do we do despite all these mechanisms if we end up still in price pressure? Well, one of the most important things to do is just remember how much it's going to cost you to give away even 10%, even 5%, let alone common figures that get banded around like 20%. Depending on your average DGP for that product or service, it could cost you a huge amount. You could end up having to do twice the volume to stand still. So be very careful before you allow yourself or anyone in your business to start discounting because it comes straight off the bottom line. I would counter with, okay, well, let's reverse this. What happens if you put the price up? Do the maths, Google it if you want. What happens if you put the price up by 1%, 2%, 5%? How much less do you have to sell in order to stand still? Would you not prefer to hit the same sales target, same GP, same net profit, and actually do less work? Hello? Remember, we're in business to make a profit, not work our little socks off. Of course, we can analyze why we've got the price pressure, and it's probably down to the facts that we're failing in one of these areas, but that's not going to help you answer their questions. And of course, the price objection could mean a shed load of different things. So be careful. Don't just take their word for it when they say, I'm going to need a discount. I need you to drop your trousers or um, you know, I need you to get a red pen out or that's more than I thought. You know, everyone can go at the offer of a price and some people just wince and get 10%. Be careful. Sharp intake of breath could cost you a lot of money, could cost you a lot of profit. We do have to remember, we do have to remember that price often disappears during a sales conversation. It's there at the beginning, 
and it comes back at the end. And we go, where, where did that come from? We dealt with that ages ago. Why are you giving me a price question now after all this time and effort? Hello, it's normal. It's what happens when someone gets ready to part with their hard-earned cash. Please remember, it's normal. You don't have to give in. So we could deal with it as an objection, and there's a fairly standard objection handling process on the screen. You know, we can reassure them and we can ask more clarification questions. We can make sure we're dealing with the right concern, not just the first one. People normally have two objections for everything, one that sounds good and the real one. Please don't take the first one. Probe and make sure you get behind it. And of course, we can do our best to answer the concern and wrap it up, evaluate and close. But if your price is really challenged and we can't handle it as an objection, then what we talk about in the profit secret is these four steps. We can defend and justify our price. That is our first job. Otherwise, you lied. Otherwise, you told a mistruth. Otherwise, you built margin in there that you knew you were going to pull out. If you just drop the price, then hello, I've just shown that you are not as professional as you thought. So be prepared to defend and justify or don't go in with that price. If you choose having defended and justified and they're still not agreeing, then you can negotiate if you wish. If after negotiation, you're still on the losing side, then you may choose to concede or you can choose to walk away. Now, you can go from one to four if you wish. You can go from two to four if you wish. You don't have to do number three. It's your choice. Step one is to defend and justify. So if someone gives you a price objection and really there's no objection handling that will get around it, then you can say things like this. You know, let's put price aside for a minute. For a minute. Let's talk about some other things. So we'll come back to price in a minute. You can say, well, you know, before I respond to that, you know, let's go back to what we're trying to create here, what the problem we're trying to solve here and make sure we've got the design right. Of course, we can ask for a bit more clarity. You know, is it about the cost or are we saying that the return's insufficient or are we saying it just feels a bit expensive or are you saying you haven't got enough money or is it a cash flow issue more than a price? It could mean lots of different things. So please make sure that we ask a variety of questions first off to try and find out what's really going on in a person's mind. And before you deal with anything else, do use my friend Elsie. Now, what else apart from that might be causing you to hesitate? What else do you and I have to agree on in order for you to feel confident and comfortable going ahead? Please remember that often at this stage, it's risk that is the issue. It's not reward. They see the downside now. They see the cost of change. And there is a cost of change if they've got a previous supply. There is a cost of implementation if we've got a new product or service going in. And if you can overcome that friction, if you can reverse or remove or reduce the perceived risk, then often the sale goes through. So remember our goal is to create a disruptive innovation for our prospects that is not disruptive to adopt. We've got to get the balance of pain and gain right or we end up with inertia. And we win best when obviously the gain exceeds the pain. And that pain has to include the cost of acquisition, the cost of implementation. So please remember to write some things down. Okay, so we defend and justify it. And if you choose, because it's, it's not worked, that you're gonna go to step two, then you're gonna negotiate. Get a commitment from them that if, if I could do something, would, would, you be prepared to go ahead. If we can get anywhere near that, uh, you know, what's the chances of us actually doing the business? If they won't commit, then there's no point negotiating. If they will say, yeah, if we can get the formula right, then definitely we're going to go ahead. You've got a chance. Then it's about trading asymmetrical variables. A pound cannot equal a pound. Maud and Mabel were in the kitchen. Two seven-year-old girls. They both want an orange. There's only one orange left. They are fighting. There's blood. There's nails. There's hair. They're screaming. It's not pleasant. 
Mum walks in, sees the situation and goes, I know what to do, grabs a knife and cuts the orange in half, gives half to Maud and half to Mabel. Problem solved. No, both girls turn on mum. Blood, nails, hair, screaming. Why? Because Maud wanted the pith to put in a cake. Mabel wanted the flesh to squeeze to have a drink of orange. They could both have had 100% of what they were looking for. When we compromise, when a pound equals a pound and we compromise, you want it for 50 pounds, they are selling it for 100 pounds, and the two of you compromise, so you end up on 75 pounds, you've both lost 25 pounds. A pound cannot equal a pound. We trade, exchange asymmetrical variables. I come up with something that doesn't cost me much and is of huge value to you, and I think of something that's of huge value you could give me that doesn't cost you much. And now we can do a negotiation. Now that deal will stick. It will hold. Win, win, or no deal. If people believe you're going into a negotiation and a trade, negotiation is a trade of asymmetrical variables, that you're determined to have them win as much as you, that attitude probably will get you in. I hope you've written some things down. I hope you've got plenty of notes. I promised you I'd reveal my most single most important question that salespeople should ask, that I would give you some real life examples and we'd find some ways to apply some of the secrets in the profit secrets. Hopefully you've collected those lessons today. Happy to open it up to questions. Well, thank you very much, Bob. That was uh, that was a real masterclass. And, uh, you know, some of those learnings are, are you know, fantastic. Uh, the, be a consultant and a detective. Don't use the why question. And uh, I shall certainly be investing, uh, investigating the scamper model um, in terms of uh, differentiating when uh, I'm doing some work with my wife's business. So that was excellent. Mm -hmm.